Hi, this is Tim, and welcome to Talks with Tim Live. Tonight, we're going to be going over an RS Logix 5000 program. This actually was my first RS Logix 5000 program. Michael, how are we sounding over there? Is everything working right? You got all your little stats saying good things? Hey, I want to just take a moment and say thanks to Michael. He's actually the person behind these live streams that makes all the little things and doodads work. Oh, and hey, Jeff Kuiper. I see Jeff Kuiper's in chat there. Jeff and I, Jeff is a very competent competitor of mine. We talk at least once a week, very knowledgeable on all the things, much more knowledgeable than me. But all right, we are going to be going over, like I said, it's, I probably, I probably had one year of experience at this point in my programming career. And yeah, I definitely thought I was near the top of my game. And, you know, and honestly, like many of my eager commenters that are very quick to, sh can you silence that, man? <laughs> that are very quick to uh, point out things that I could do better. I was probably that way. I was quick to show you a better way and wouldn't acknowledge that maybe what you were doing did work. Uh, and this is an old program. In fact, uh, uh, Frank Lamb and I were just talking on LinkedIn. Uh, this program was uh, version 7. And he's like, I didn't know about RS Logix till version 8. Well, I got looking. And apparently version 6 seems to be the first thing Rockwell, that I could find Rockwell related. Uh, does anybody else know? What was the first public version of RS5000? Anybody out there know? All right, but here is the program we're going to be going through today. And I'm going to be a lot more critical of myself than I was in the first program. The first program, if you recall, I had three hours of programming experience before I started this 300-rung uh, program. And this program has a lot of good things going for it, but I think it misses some of those fundamentals in hindsight that make for an easy to troubleshoot program down the road. And I'll go a little further into that in just a second, but let's just take a look at it and see what we have. So we're gonna go into the main program and one, yeah, I figured out by now how to make subroutines. As you recall, in my uh, previous program, I had everything dumped into Ladder 2, which that was an RS Logix 500 program. But now I've, I've figured out how to break things up and I figured out how to do all types of neat things. And really, when I opened up the main routine though, I cringed right away and not off of this, mainly right down here off of this sequencer logic right here. And this is something that a lot of you have asked me to go over how it works. And really I have, I have not gone over it because I don't think this is a good way to sequence machines. And let's just start though at rung zero and just see what we got going on. So right here, one, I'm looking that this, e, that this ethernet module is really, I'm pretty sure that that is, that it's um, enabled. And if it is, then we're going to do a message instruction, which is kind of wasteful because I don't think it would ever inhibit it. So that wasted a little power there with that GSV. Now in later processors, it doesn't matter, but this was an L1 processor. Now I did, I didn't download, I think this uh, in the end was a version nine program. I can't even remember now. I, well, um, I looked at the original, it was a version seven, but there were a few updates on it. I didn't want to download the old version, so I did convert it to version 32, and I think I made this a, what did I make this? I made this a, an L71 processor, processor, but this was an L1 M1 processor, is what was in this one. And, all right, we're looking for a screen number. And all right, I'm gonna start knocking myself right away a little bit, is I can kind of interpret this all right, the e-stop is not pressed, and we apparently have an e-stop okay and a cycle start. All right, and then we're gonna do a latch, and I know a lot of you are gonna criticize my latch here, but um, we'll look at this. We'll see how good or bad my um, my latch is compared to a seal in. And, but I don't know what screen number two was. Um, I have no idea. I, I, you know, it seems like screen number one would be the main screen so I have no idea why you had to switch to screen screen two to make it run an auto. 
So there should be a description here. I mean, and you know, I've got I've got some tag descriptions and things like that, but I should have added a description or an, a run comment here saying, you know, screen one. Oops, oh, I don't get my number lock on. One is auto or something. I should have done something because yeah, here this here I am twenty years later. I have no earthly idea what this is. But okay, let's look at this auto. Let's see how I did my latch and unlatch. I'm hoping that I have a latch here and an unlatch here. And maybe there's like a first scan bit that's unlatching. So I'm gonna cross reference this. And then I'm gonna sort by the destructive column. Oops, why is that not sorting right? There it goes. And yeah, we're used three places. We've got an output latch, an un output unlatch, because that's what we're looking at. And then here on rung 10, all right, if cycle is complete, then we'll unlatch auto mode. Cycle reset will unlatch auto mode. And yeah, first scan will unlatch auto mode. So I wouldn't knock myself tremendously for this latch unlatch here. But uh, the next rung is where I'm going to start knocking myself pretty hard is if we just look at this rung especially 20 years later or never seeing the setup before we're not going to have any earthly idea what this is doing now this is a sequencer in instruction and a sequencer out instruction you tie these together with this control bit I had, and honestly, I have not looked through this very much, but I just noticed there's a this is a user-defined data type, which, yeah, I guess they did have them that early on. Um, huh. Well, let's just take a moment and look at this. So if I mouse over it, it is data type of machine. Hey, Jay Ashton, how you doing? Let's go down to our assets and then user defined. Hey, Michael, is my video blurry? No. No? No. No, Jeff, uh, Michael says the video is not blurry. Is anybody else having trouble with the video being blurry? Could be quality of possession of that. All right, and what does he do about that? Change the quality? No. Jeff, find your quality setting, Michael says. Which is somewhere, because he's not, he's just giving me a blank stare. Uh, on desktop, you scroll down to, I mean, not scroll down, you go over to the bottom right of the screen and then you hit the little gearbox. Hit the gearbox. Quality and then you hit 1080p or 720. Quality and then 1080p. <laughs> Hopefully that helps you out, Jeff. All right. But, okay, well, we actually have a bunch of user-defined data types here. And I'm not going to say that this is good or bad yet. But, okay, we were looking. What was that? What was the data type? Machine. All right, we have a machine data type. And, okay, so this looks like we're kind of consolidating the basic functionality of this machine. We have auto mode, manual mode, end cycle, cycle complete, count complete. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I bet you I'm going to knock myself in a little bit for this internal. I'm not sure what that is. Timers, counters, control, and then, oh, it kind of goes on and on. Oh. Okay, we apparently were doing some part tracking on shifts, some runtime on shifts. So I guess in modern times, we would call this things for OE calculations. And got some motion control. All right. You know, I won't knock myself yet for this, but this looks like it is very encompassing. And I'm going to have to, maybe by the end of this, I'll kind of remember exactly why I decided to do do it this way. But all right, where were we? we? Okay, we were talking about the sequencer output. 
mainly these two, the, this SQI sequencer input and this SQO sequencer output, are locked together by this control right here. You see the control of this one is lsbw1.control. Now lsbw1 was the name of this machine. So it, that control right there is the exact same as this. So as one of them goes up, the other one will go up. And that's what's gonna tie these together. And just a really quick spill on the SQI because like I said, I don't wanna to get too far into this is you've got an array here. And this array is gonna tell what conditions each thing needs to be in for each step of this. So if we monitor this, and I drag that out a little bit, then we're gonna see all these different ones and zeros, which are things that it's looking for for all these steps. And what's cool about this and why people like it from a programming standpoint is that if I want, and, and here's, here, we're getting, I'm getting ready to hammer, hammer myself pretty hard. If I wanted whatever bit four is here, would, that it, if I said it needed to be on right here, I can just type a one and that'll be a condition for it. It's that easy. And same with the outputs. If we go to them, and we go to monitor, then yeah, we see ones and zeros in various steps here. And these are the outputs that are gonna be on during each step. And if I decide whatever the world number four is, I want it to be on in step four, I just need to put a one there. And now it's gonna be on. That easy to make a change to our sequence. But here's where the problem comes in, is what in the world is bit four that I'm editing here. And I can put money that, yeah, yeah, there is zero description there. And probably um, up here, well, yeah, there's probably zero description. There's the inputs. There's zero description here. So there's no identifiable marks to help me understand what I was thinking on this sequence. You've got to really be in the mindset of wanting to, you know, of knowing what the world's going on. So I did this for quite a while and finally I went to a plant and, you know, I was programming a machine and the machine was working perfectly and the maintenance supervisor came up to me and, you know, he's like, hey, how's it going? You know, and I'm like, yeah, it's, you know, it's going good. And, you know, he's, he's feeling me out. I didn't know it at the time, but, you know, he's looking, he's like, hey, what is that? And he's pointing at that sequencer instruction. And I'm all proud and I'm telling him exactly how it works and this and that and the other. And, you know, he just nods and, you know, he acts like he's learning. And at the end, he told me, he said, if you ever use anything like that again in this plant, then we're not going to allow you back in. And I was floored by it. And I'm like, well, what's wrong with it? He said, that particular instruction is very specific, one to AB, and also from a maintenance standpoint, looking at it later, if you don't know exactly what's going on, it's really difficult to follow. And, and he was right in the end. He was wrong a little bit in the end because, hey, what I was doing is working. Even this machine here is still working. You know, uh, but from a maintenance standpoint, if you don't understand all the little things, it's very difficult. So what, the main thing I think we're going to go through tonight is talk about different ways that I could have done this. And we'll just see where it goes besides that, because there are some other things that we may explore. But mainly he was right about this. Now, the key to understanding this sequencer is this XOR statement here. But really, from a troubleshooting standpoint, if you're trying to figure out why something isn't working and you're looking across here, and you get to this X4, and then you see this AFI, which is an always false input, you're gonna be like, oh, well, that must be something that else they were doing at some point, it's not important. And you would blow right past it and be like, next rung. But what this is doing is this is comparing what the actual inputs are to what's in that particular array position for that sequencer step. And if there anything that doesn't line up is gonna be right here. And that's why this is called diagnostics. Is so whatever this, and let's see how I did at this, whatever bit number six is, 
is what the machine was waiting for at this particular time. So if I monitor this, I hope that I have some descriptions here. <clears throat> and I don't, you know, so I was, I was very much dependent on a very sharp mind and a very fresh understanding of how the sequencer input and output setup worked. Because right now I don't know what bit six is. So to figure that out, I would have to go back up and look at these inputs here. And hopefully they have descriptions. Please, do, oops, wrong place. Please tell me that they have descriptions. Um, to monitor. Okay, well, yes, they have descriptions. And okay, number six was it had to be in the unload position. But all right, let's back up a little bit more and make sure, like I said, I don't want to get too much into how these sequencers work, but we're going to need to understand a little bit. So again, this array here is going to look at the sequencer position. So we have an array and we have the source and it's really going to compare the two. In fact, you know, if I had to do it this way, and honestly, I would not do it this way today. Absolutely would not. Then... One, I'm not worried about this mask because this mask is minus one. Now we've had some videos on this, but let's make sure we know what is minus one mean in a mask. Well, first, what is a mask? Is a mask, it says, which bits in this do you care about and which ones do you want to ignore? And the ones with a zero, we're going to ignore. The ones with a one, we're going to pay attention to. So if I just go and create a tag, Let's close some of this out. Actually got to edit tags anyway. And I'm just gonna call this my dent and it's gonna be a double integer. And now I'm gonna go to monitor tags. Then if we go to the value, right now the value is zero. And all of my bits are zero in this. And we did a binary episode that talked about this. But if I put a minus one in here, then it's going to make all of the bits inside of it a one. And so I'm not even using that mask. So I shouldn't say you should. Yeah, I would. I would ignore it. And if we ignore that mask, let me just think about this really quick then why couldn't I use an equal statement? Now, again, I'm just throwing something together here really off the top of my head, but if we were to bring an equal statement down here, actually, let's just start and copy this wrong. And yeah, we bring an equal statement down. And I, like I said, I'm not worried about the mask. So I compare that input to the, actually, there it is right there. Yeah, I don't even need that. I compare it to that. And if those two are equal, then, well, one, that would work, but even, even more, what we really want to do is, one, we could use a counter, just like in, in the previous one, we used a counter here, kind of. But how would I, how could I do this? I could do a counter or I could do an add. And so, I mean, just to really make this clearer, one will take that out now. This really, I don't know how important this is. Well, yeah, this was probably, we'll figure out where all that was used at later. But then let's just do an add because that would be different than the counter. So we'll go over here and we'll bring an add statement down. And and well, yes, I know this is a control because I'm, I'm just kind of cobbling this together. I'm going to use that control. Paste it there. And we're going to add one. And then we're going to put that in that exact same spot. And then I'm going to do a move. And I'm going to move. All right, there's my destination. 
And again, this is a minus one, so obviously I wasn't really worried about it. In fact, I'm not even using this length, this max length here. So we'll see it in a little bit. And then we'll drag that there. Yeah, that would do the, and I, eh, do I need the enable? Do I need a one shot here? No, I wouldn't need a one shot even. So, now again, I didn't test this, but I think that would do nearly the same thing. And mainly we're, like the, like the maintenance supervisor was saying in that situation, these are very native instructions. I mean, we can kind of figure out what an equal is. We can figure these things out. But again, this is not how I would do this today. And so that's what we're getting ready to hit. Is first, there, here, let's talk about the pitfalls of this. In fact, let me just delete this back out. This is where we were. And let's understand where these inputs are coming from. If we go down here, here are our inputs. And so these are the conditions individually that really, how do I put this? It's not like this is what you need to get to the next step. These are conditions that it may or may not look at. So this is shear, punch, down. Okay, because yeah, we could be cutting or we could be shearing. And shear, punch, up. We got some clamps up, clamps down. Angle in position, angle in drive. And mainly though, when we go to look at this program, it's not real intuitive that... What is wrong? Now, let's go back and look at this. So we had our diagnostics saying that it's bit six. That's what it's waiting on right now. And so then we've got to go, well, really, if I didn't know where I was going next, I would have to go to cross-reference or I could go to monitor. And I got to find bit six. And now I'm going to cross-reference that. Okay, and yeah, output energized. Yeah, that's probably what it's waiting on. But even now, I gotta think back in my head because I didn't even note it. Is it looking for it to be on or is it looking for it to be off? And, well, let me, I mean, let's get back here. Okay, right now it's a zero and it is looking for it to be a one. So now I can go back and be like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So it was looking at this point for it to be in the unload position, but really, Quickly glancing at any of this from a troubleshooting perspective, this program is going to be really difficult. And in my opinion now, the sequencers are really difficult to troubleshoot. And this isn't just an A-B thing. This goes for any type of sequencer that kind of uses these, let's call them one and zero charts that this is going by in that array to navigate. All right, I'm dragging a little bit. Got to, got to hit some coffee. Which while I am, um, hope you're subscribed to our channel. Uh, you know, we do put out at least one video a week. And any questions that come up, even if it doesn't have to do with exactly what I'm talking about right now, feel free to put them down in the chat and we can take some time and answer them. All right, but okay, so that kind of tells you how the inputs work. And then we have the outputs. So if we go back to our main program, then yeah, we had this destination, which is this out here. Let's just cross-reference it because really that's what I would have to do. And all right, we're gonna see, well, I was gonna say we'd see them used in the outputs. Hmm, but they're not. They're used in drive, they're used in inputs, they're used in main routine, oh, okay, and they're used in outputs. So not real clear, but okay, I would guess if I was looking for an output that it would be in the outputs. And mainly, this is the first thing that kind of looks <laughs> in some way like, a, like code I would want to troubleshoot is, all right, we have an unloader, and this is the unloader up. And it is going to go up if it's in auto mode, and looks like we had an auto unload, which I guess you could enable and disable it. And then we're looking for that unload output, and... Tool index. I don't remember what tool index is. It'll hopefully come to me again. I definitely was not thinking that I would be looking at this program in 20 years, I guess, when I um, commented this. 
Although at least it does have some. And okay, I can figure auto un, auto mode out. And then okay, also it looks like if it's not in auto mode, you could unload it. That's interesting. I don't know why. There must have been something special about the unloader because manual mode is usually required, it looks like. But apparently the unloader would work anytime. Again, I mean, it's 20 years. I don't know. I do want to jump back to something else now that we're looking at descriptions. Is okay, this doesn't have a comment. And I can figure it out because it's auto mode. But remember, we had those internal ones. Where were they? Let's see. Machine. Yeah. Okay. And that's, so if we monitor this, or I mean, we cross, or yeah, we got a monitor on it. Then, yeah, I hope that these are not used. Please tell me these are not used. Oh, dear. Okay. So, <laughs> they are definitely used. And um, they are definitely not just something internal. I mean, we have encoder. Let's see. Let's bring this in. Bring that out. Encoder zeroed. We have set time. Calibrate. Jog stop. So these are not. And here's what, and actually, yeah, I am going to read myself pretty hard on this, is I see this all the time in programs, is I'll go into a program, and there will be a tag down here. Well, we just made one, my dent, but it won't be called my dent. We'll have a tag that is called bits, and every bit in that thing will be used for something in a program. And I did put descriptions on this. Let me get back where I was. Oh, that's right. It's on the cross-reference. I did put descriptions on these, but we have tag-based addressing here to solve this very problem. Is There should have been... Yeah, I mean, I see what I was trying to do. I was trying to make a nice, tidy AOI to have everything to do with the machine. But this didn't fit anywhere, and instead of, I should have just created a tag that said encoder zeroed, or set time, or calibrate, or weld cycle, or, you know, all these things. They should have, they should have been tags, and it's not as important now, because now comments should be downloaded with the program, but in an L1 processor, and even up, I think, to an L61, when did, when did they start storing comments in the programs in the control logic. So I don't even remember, but the L1 definitely didn't do it. So that's that's a major issue with this program is, is these internal things. I mean, yeah, there was zero need for these to be here. But okay, how would I do this if I was doing it today? I guess is the grand question is I, well, okay, last time we did talk about using a counter. Well, how would you guys do it? I mean, we could do it with a counter. I mean, that's how I did it in the five RS five RS Logics five hundred program. Um, we could do it with. Obviously, we could use a sequencer, but I think I've said pretty clear that's not a good way. We could do a. We could do well. We could do some type of bit manipulation. I think that's what I'm going to lean towards in this one. So we could, either. Well, let's talk about that. How can we do it with bit manipulation? Because, yeah, I don't know that we've ever done a video on this. So if we go back to my dent, and we look at it, right now, oops, wrong one. My dent, well, we have a minus one in it right now. If I put a zero in it, we, we know... Okay, Jeff Kuiper says use a bit of a word. Well, I think I think here I think he's on the same thing we're on. Yeah, I think this is the way I do it today because it it is clear. Now, let's talk about what exactly Jeff means here. Is if I put a value of one into this, then bit zero becomes a one. Now, here's where this. Can, can become really useful as far as machine steps is if I double that value, if I put a value of 2 in, 
watch this. We're going to get end up with a zero here in bit zero, and that one is going to go to bit one. Now, I'm going to double it again. Now, we're doubling every time. Don't do anything but double. If we double it again, you're going to see that one move to right here. We'll do it a few more times. So if we double four, we get eight, and we're going to see it move right here. And if we double eight, we're going to have 16. And we're going to see that move, whoops, we're going to see that move right here. So every time you double the integer, or I'm saying, no, let me be careful here. <laughs> every time you start with one and you double it, it's going to shift that bit through here. And so at that point, my dent four can be step four. My dent five can be step five. My dent six can be step six. And it's become it's going to become much easier to figure out exactly what's going on. Now I'm not going to go, I'm not going to make a perfect program here because that is going to would take some time. But let's just talk about what that would take to do. So we're just going to start right up here at the top is we're going to have, let's just add another rung in here. All right, and first we're going to need to be in auto mode. And first, just so it's clear, we're not even going to, this sequencer over here, all this we're not even going to use now. All this will be gone. Everything we're going to do is going to be in this inputs. And next, we're going to need, what is our bit? Well, let's, let's just create a tag. Well, we have one we've been using. We have, well, let's just create another. Let's make sure, because, hey, we have, we have this excellent tag database. So we can just call this our sequence. And it's going to be a dent. And then, in this case, we're going to look. sequence dot well it could be zero yeah we'll look for sequence zero we can have step zero because I'm not gonna put a tremendous amount of time into this all right now let's see now because I, I do want to make sure we make it clear that this sequencer instruction was not a strong suit is let's see if we can even figure out what the machine was waiting for actually I don't believe it's waiting for anything in step zero but let's check so we're going to go, all right, Prime says use a latch and unlatch. I don't know that I would use the latch and unlatch, but let's, we, let me put that here and see if we can talk about that a little bit. So latch and unlatch. All right. but. Uh, Okay, so we were looking here in step zero. We're going to look at this. I believe, oops, where did I go? Oops, it's down here. I don't know what I clicked on, but there's what we're looking for. So what is it looking for in step zero? It's looking for all zeros. So we're, we're really going to skip that step, and that's cool. We can do that over here, too. If we go to our, let's close some of these out. Move that one over here. Oh, gosh. That over here. Okay, we want to move. So we want to say that, yes, yeah, sequence zero really does nothing, or we want to skip it. What we're going to do is we're going to go to our move tab. Oops. And we are going to move a one, I'm sorry, a two two into sequence. Now, yeah, you're right. Somebody's probably going to jump in and say, hey, what got a one into um, the sequence? Don't worry. We're going to get to that in a second. But okay, so this would move a two into the sequence when this stuff is true. Now, there is another way I see this done. In fact, well, yeah, for now, I'm just going to throw something up here. Now, th this part here, I'm just throwing up here for a visual. I wouldn't do it this way. But just so we have something. Is auto mode. The moment that we get auto mode, turn auto mode on, 
we're going to put a one shot in here and I'm going to call this sequence start and that'll be a boolean tag and that moment we are going to move oops move without an e We're going to move a zero, or we're going to move a one to sequence. So that's going to get us started. Whenever they start in auto mode, immediately we're going to move a one into the sequence. we got a one shot there, so it'll only happen one time. And then we're going to look at sequence zero. This is going to quickly move a two into the sequence. And let's go ahead and add some real meat to this, though. That way it doesn't look like we're just bouncing around. Is now, whoops, one thing. This needs to look at auto mode. I thought I had that in there, but I guess I didn't. And then, yeah, there we're going to look at auto mode. And this time, we're going to look at sequence dot one. And now let's see if we can figure out what it actually took to get out of step one. So we go back to our main routine. And let's see, we're looking for, yeah, what are we looking for? This array monitor. Oh, that's how I end up getting there. That's right there. Okay. Okay, step one is looking, and here's where this is going to get brutal until we get this kind of worked out. It's looking for bit number two and bit number five. So if we go back, bit number two, where the clamp's up. And there was a timer associated with it. And here, hey, yeah, I don't like this at all. Again, I think I was trying to make a nice, cool, compact AOI, but this right here is not cool because when I'm looking at this, timers 13, that should be the clamps up timer. And so, but mainly we're looking for the clamps to be up. So I'm just gonna throw a timer in here. And I'm going to call this clamps up. And we'll just create that. And I'm just going to throw one second on that. And then we're going to look at clamps up. And clamps up and move a four to it and take it to the next one. Why is it not? Why is it not like that? Oh, needs accumulated value. There we go. So this is one way that you could definitely do it. And I think this becomes decently easy to follow, mainly because we're going to be stuck, like in this case, we have sequence zero or step zero, which skips. And now this becomes step one. And so we're going to look through and we're going to find which step it's not on. Now, there's one other way I see this done, and I'm not as big of a fan of it, is it does exactly the same thing. It's, you'll see this with a multiply. And it's going to multiply the sequence number by 2. And it's going to put the sequence number back in. Now, this is going to do exactly the same thing. And I can copy this. I can paste it here. And it does, it does work. The issue I have with this is it doesn't, if you don't know that multiplying that number by 2 shifts that bit, then you're going you're gonna to look at this and be like, what are they doing? So, I mean, that's why anymore it's, it's much more, I'm much more of, hey, let's just hit with the basic plain stuff. So, put that back like it was. All right, now this only gets half our battle done. It's okay. We don't need anything to happen now in sequence zero. But obviously we need our clamps to go up, our clamps to go up in step in sequence one. So I'm just going to copy this bit. 
And now let's get our outputs and see if we can find our clamps. You gotta love that temp 20 years later. Um, <laughs> the temp is still there. But all right, let's see clamps. Oh, good grief. There it is. The clamp's up. So right now it's that is really delete that. And we can put that there. Now, one thing I need to do here is I need to actually die. I need to put something on this because obviously one, let's talk, let's make sure we know this. Why can't I get that to go? There we go is I can put a description on sequence. And now let's just put a, mis a description of machine sequence. And you see, it actually fills it in all the way down, which is kind of cool. You know, we could go there and we can see that, yeah, this is machine sequence. But all right, machine sequence doesn't give us a good idea of exactly what is going on here. And if we go, Back to our controller tags, though, if we go to step one, we can also name just this particular one is I can call this, uh, actually, we don't need to call it sequence. We probably could guess that it's step one, but let's just go ahead and say step one clamps up. Now we can see that, okay, this is definitely step one clamps up. So that makes it really easy to figure out what that is. So there's how we could kind of get through that. Martin, yeah, yeah you're pretty, yeah, I, I get, yeah, hold on a second on the output latch. We'll, we'll look at it in just a second. Because there are, there are pros and cons to it. And, you know, honestly, I, I, can, I can argue that either way. But hold on, let's get a little further through this. Okay. So that would get us through that. And now I'm just going to act like this is the end of it. Is let's say we get to the end. Add a rung. Well, we need something to tell it the cycle's complete. So actually, we had a rung for this. And that's what we probably need to do is find that rung. Because we probably could massage that rung. There was a rung about cycle complete here. You know, we probably could spend a lot of time. Oh, good grief. There's a cycle complete. You know, I bet we could spend numerous days in this program. I, ha I haven't looked at this in so long. I mean, I'm not saying I was doing something horrible in this program. I just didn't like the way I did the sequencing. There's some pretty neat things going on. We may look at that in just a second. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I should have done a little broader overview of this program and just saw what all was in it. But okay, we're going to bring that into here. We're just going to act like... That is the end of our sequence there. Whoops, went off by one. That's all right, we're gonna say cycle complete, but now that's gonna be sequence number two. And again, we can put a description on that particular one and we can call that cycle complete. Okay, and it looks like, yeah, you know, I'm trying to remember how this system worked exactly. Ah, okay, yeah, that's right, because this could punch holes, it could shear things, and then it finally got one tool code that said I'm done. But all right, still, this would work very similarly. So cycle complete, but all right, we're going to unlatch auto mode. We're going to unlatch the end cycle. We're going to unlatch encoder zero because that part's going to be out and it's going to need to do another one. Okay, and here it is. This index dot, oh no, index dot index. So we extend branch down. And in this case, one of two things here. I would probably just move a one here. And that really makes this first rung not necessarily. But that gets it ready for the next cycle. Man, I'm trying to remember now. <laughs> it said 20 years later, the one thing I'll tell you right off the bat is 
this, I think it was 20 years later, this program needed some severe documentation because it did some really neat things. Um, let's just see here. So there's a sequencer. I mean, it's PCs. I think this, yeah, I think this thing was actually reading data from a supervisory network. And I mean, yeah, that's not a big deal now, but it was, it was a pretty cool thing then. All right, and I mean, we're, we're tracking, you know, like I said, we're tracking some shift data. What else are we doing? Oh gosh, I mean, you guys don't name tags temp tags. Especially when, yeah, that tag is still in there after all this time. Um, man, had a fault handling routine. I have no, you know, here's where. That's right, and this had, I think this had a motion. You know, we didn't even go over the I.O. configuration on this thing. So, yeah, this, this was an L1, M1 initially. It had an ENET module in it. Um, okay, and it had a panel view. That's probably a standard panel view back then. All right, it had an MO2AE. This was an analog servo module. It had 16 in and looks like 32 out. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a large scale thing by any means, but, you know, did some motion control on it. But all right, let's talk about the, the latch and latch method. Now, I mean, I honestly, well, honestly, I don't know that I see anything wrong with it much as you just don't see it used that way much is you could have right here, same deal as we could have put on oh, this case. The issue with the latch and latch really is when it is improperly written and can get out of sync. So like right now, I want to latch, in this case, sequence dot one. Now, I'm not saying anything about what I need to unlatch. So in this one, I would need to latch Actually, just drag that down, make it easy on me. Sequence two. And you would unlatch sequence one. Oops. The wrong one. Unlatch sequence one. And then on this one, we'll just copy both of those down. And this would be three. Oh, actually, in this case, there is no three, but we made a really short thing here. And this works really well as long as everything is really nice and tidy. The issue comes in when it's not nice and tidy. One, this leaves a lot of opportunity, and this is what a lot of people complain about is, yeah, we have an unlatch here. If we decide we need to unlatch somewhere else, it can get a little gray. Also, we're not clearly making sure that, I don't know, sequence five doesn't get toggled here. And that's what people complain about is, so if, if I'm here, and let's just throw something in here. Again, I'm just throwing some stuff in just so we got something to work with. Let's say that this was sequence five. And they're looking at this and they're like, man, if I just had sequence five on, this would work. But right now I'm in sequence one. If you use the latch unlatch method, and there's not anything that's going to prevent someone from toggling this bit and thinking that they're forcing it into sequence five. And now we have sequence five on and we'd have sequence one on at the same time. So the advantage of the move there is not only does it write a one, like in this case it's writing a one to bit one, it's also writing a zero to bit zero and bit two through 31. So I kind of, there's nothing you know, cleanly written. There's nothing wrong with the latch unlatch, but I think, yeah, I think in most cases I I would prefer the move just because it it cleans up the opportunity for that to happen. Okay, what other questions do we have here? And I'm just now I kind of want to just explore this program and see what all I was doing because. There's a lot going on here. 
looks like, all right, I don't, that's right, this had a supervisory system. This was probably me over, way the heck overthinking this thing. But in the case of a fault, it would gather the fault data. And this right here, this ESSVR was a supervisory system. So even if this machine faulted out of a major fault code, it would send that fault out and it would actually send it to the local panel view. It might be some neat diagnostic thing in here. Let's see. Yeah, I probably should have um, definitely reviewed this a little bit more before we started, but let's just see here if we can find that. Let's see. So this was the supervisory thing. Huh. All right, we haven't talked about heartbeat request. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not trying to say the latch on latch is bad. I mean, yeah, I, I mean, cleanly written, I have no problem with the latch on latch. But boy, I don't know if you saw the comments. Um, I posted a video, oh, it's been a couple months now, on how to do latch on latch in Studio 5000. You would imagine the number of people that said, please quit teaching people latch on latch. I'm like, well, if, are there any other instructions you don't want to be taught? I mean, really, we need to understand them. We don't need to hide from them. But okay, yeah, this was cool. It was actually, this was, this was pull, this would send out what, um, what job it was running to the PC and then it had to get back the data. Oh, there you go. The last time I was connected to this was 2006. Let's see, what? Monitor. Yeah, July 19th, 2006, good grief. Who would have known that four months later, Amber and I would both quit our jobs, pregnant with our first kid and start this company. What a oh, crazy, scary flashback. But all right, I'm getting off on a tangent here. Let's see. All right. So I think, hopefully, I'm not, and again, that kind of goes for the sequencer instruction too. I shouldn't say that it's a bad thing to have this, but I think there are better ways that we could have cleaned this up. Let's see here. What are other ways we could do this? So we've had to latch and unlatch. We could do the move. We could do the math. These are the ones that really jump out at me of how we could have cleaned this up a little bit. Because, yeah, I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, if we continue doing this, this is, this is just going to be a very large headache to figure out, you know, what needs to be where on this. Okay, just trying to, now I'm just popping through this program, just trying to see what all are we doing. Okay, so this is some diagnostics. Well, this is interesting. I, I am going to actually, you know, we actually probably could. I mean, this is a really, this may have been one of my better things I did in this is I rolled my own alarm code, which I, you know, and I, I've, I've said in other videos, I really don't like how the panel view does their alarms. And I really do like how I did this because this, this, that's what this is doing is it's making kind of a multi-state or multi-list indicator of alarms. And they're also sorted by severity or what mainly would happen to be um, stopping the machine. But All right, getting back to where we were. Back to main routine. We were trying to dissect how we would clean up that. So one, we would get rid of the sequencer. Hey, I just thought about something. Um, hey, Paul, are you in the chat this evening? You had a question about last week's program, and I just realized um, there may be an easier way that we could have done that. So if you are, just just pop in the chat, and we may um, we may jump over to that program just so we can show that. Okay, but all right, let's get back to where we were. So, mainly step two, we had a couple conditions, because I want to get to where we have a couple conditions, and I think even here we did, or I'm sorry, step one. So step one, again, we're going to have to, good grief, 
I think I'm really going to dislike sequencers, or I'm going to have a reminder of why I'm not supposed to use these by the end of this. Is our right, input step one? Yeah, there were two things. So we had bit two, and we also had bit five. So if we go to our inputs, bit two, or yeah, bit two was clamps up. We also had bit five. Okay, so there had to be angle in the drive. All right, and here we go. We're looking, all right, we're looking for the output, angle and drive. And we're looking for beginning of angle. So even here, this is not clear at all. I mean, I think, yeah, I think I've beat this like a dead horse that that's not very good. But okay, we have multiple conditions. We need that angle is in drive or that the encoder has been zeroed. And what it meant by the encoder has been zeroed is that there's already a part in there being processed. So here, and actually, so clamps up, that just happens. Oops, wrong side. We would need that, and then input five, this one. All right, so that would be actually what it is. And even now, reading it, it just reads much clearer. As first, we have, we've got to be in auto mode. We know step one, clamps up, and actually, okay, this is actually clamps up, angle, in drive. All right, and then we have a you know a one second timer for the clamps up. And the clamps didn't have switches on them, so really they were up, and you had to wait a certain amount of time, and that that was probably a downfall. Well, not on this machine really, but really, if I have my choices, I'm going to run switch to switch. But all right, clamps up. We got a one thousand second, a uh, thousand, ugh, a one second or a thousand millisecond timer on it. And then we, when it's done, we're also looking for these two conditions. And then, oh, that's where we have those latches, unlatches. I was scratching my head for a second. There we go. And then we're going to move to the next step. So now let's just copy and paste this. So we can get a little bit of this in here and see if we can start understanding how mainly we would troubleshoot it. Because that's, that's really the big thing. Sorry, let's look now at step two. That's going to put an eight in here. And probably maybe the most difficult part about this one is understanding these, these values. And really the easiest way initially to do that is to put a value in here. Or, okay, we know in this case, oops, where am I? There it is. We can just use the sequence. So if we have an eight in here, we can see that that is step three. All right, but now we have to go dissect this sequencer again and figure out what was supposed to happen. So step two, we go to our controller tags and we go up and find this array. All right, and this time we are looking for, oh, okay. So now, in, okay, we're gonna have to massage our earlier one a little bit. We're still looking for the clamps to be up and now we're looking for, what is that? 15, 14, we're looking for bit 13, which now we're gonna go hunt and figure out what bit 13 is. And bit 13, yeah. What a mess. I did something wrong. I either counted wrong. All right, what did I see? Oh, I'm on the output array. Oh, why didn't somebody tell me that? All right. So in this case, okay, <laughs> what a coincidence. We are still looking for bit to the clamps down, so we're uh, clamps up. We're gonna have to work on it a little bit. And then eight, nine, we're looking for bit nine. And bit nine, 
Okay, it's wheels down. Okay, so, and wheels and clamps are two different things. So this had some wheels to drive this angle and move it around. Is, all right. And it looks like we had a two second timer on it. Now, I made a mistake in my earlier one that is showing up now, is we're also looking for clamps down this second, or sorry, clamps up the second time. But this timer right here, I don't need to time again. They're already, they're already up. So this should have gone on the output. So I'm actually gonna copy this. Actually, I'm just gonna cut the TON out because I do wanna look for the clamps up to be done. And now we're gonna go to our outputs. And all right, right there's the clamps up. Is we're gonna put a branch. Actually, you know, and I did something earlier that I don't know that I always do. I did that way. And there's nothing wrong with this. This actually will work perfectly. But usually I would actually do it this way. I got in a hurry there. This does the exact same functionality. Actually, that does the exact same functionality because it does hit this one, then go to the branch, and then go to that. But that's probably how I would normally do it just to keep confusion down in studio 5000 you can have as many outputs and series as you want it's not a big deal all right now we're going to have our clamps up anytime the clamps are up it's going to start this timer all right and also now we know that in sequence two we also need this clamps up so we're going to put that there Oh, and I need to change that now. It's not cycle complete anymore. Now this is step two wheels down. Now I wouldn't put clamps down again because really the movement that I would be looking for in step two is the wheels down. Now I think wheels down is, yeah, it was. It was a two second timer. But okay, while we're here, we find the wheels. Steer down. Did that go the wrong way? Yep, went the wrong way. Clamps down. Drive up, drive down. Ooh, I think I called it wheels. Drive. Okay. So here is the down. So this needs to become oops. I'll stop there. Sequence dot two. That's gonna be step two wheels down. And right here, we're going to put a timer. And this is going to be wheels down. And that was two seconds. So now we go back to our inputs. Then this one, I could, oops, where'd I go? Yep. This one, I'll get that out of there. I'm getting ready to really mess up. Now really, we're just looking for wheels down. Okay. So then we're going to go to step three. So let's just copy and paste this. This time we're going to move a 16, and this is going to be 3, and now we got to go figure out what step 3 is. So we go back to, actually I think I probably still have it here, yep, array, step 3. We're still looking for those clamps, now we're still looking for the wheels. So and here's where this can get really confusing because you've got to compare it to the previous one to figure out what action are you really looking for. But I'm looking for 8, 9, 10. So whatever 10 is this time. So if we get our inputs, we go down to figure out what 10 is. Encoder 0. So we're looking for the beginning of the angle. Now we need to update our outputs a little bit here because Let's see, what is it? Oh, okay, encoder zeroed. And, okay, in this case, as much as I hate this internal, that's all we're looking for here. Now we do need to go back and update some outputs because there was some action going on here. So we'll put that in place of that. 
All right, and that gets us through enough steps, I think. We don't need to continue through any more. Um, but all right, mainly, now we need to back up and figure out what these outputs were in these sequencers. So we get our controller tags. All right, okay, and output zero actually has some, now that's really weird. It had, um, huh, kind of curious now. And it output zero and output three were on in step zero. So let's see what output zero and three even were. Huh? Drive down, clamps up, then And then immediately afterward, oh yeah, I mean, I think I really, yeah, I was blowing past this anyway, so it probably ignored that one completely. I have to go back and look real close at what's going on there. But mainly step one, we're looking for bit two and bit four. So if we go over to our outputs, actually, no, we can't even do that. This is this in here, this is where this one gets difficult. Is no, I'm looking for output two. I gotta figure out where it's used. So we're gonna go to our outputs up here. And we'll sort by the reference. And we find number two. All right, two was clamps up, and we took care of that one. Four is angle and drive. So that was, okay. And actually the way this one's set up, it doesn't actually, it's really, it's using, looking for the beginning of the angle. Now we have that as step two. So that's, that's not a problem there. And here's where this gets really gray, the sequencer out, because okay, I assigned a bit arbitrarily for really the step that is looking for angle and drive. Well, now if we look on our new one, wherever it went, yeah. Then really, right here, we're looking for encoder zeroed. That's all, it, and okay, this is step three, encoder zeroed. But okay, now we go to step two It's even spinning trying to track this sequencer, and I wrote it. So step two is just looking for the clamps down. So in step two, we also need to look for clamps down, and then we had number 13. Okay, we'll have to hit the clamps, but also what the world is number 13. And 13 is wheels down, okay. But I mean, this 13 lines up with nothing. And that's that's why I kind of argue very against this now because yeah, it allows you infinite programming flexibility, but infinite headaches on the troubleshooting side. But okay, so we need to find, where was uh, clamps in the wheels? I think I just scrolled the wrong way. Clamps down, no clamps up. The sequence one, sequence two, okay, those are there. And we did, all right, we did the drive down, sequence two. So then number three. All right, now our clamps down, we know that one. Um, I think that one, no, that's seven. So, okay, wait a second. Oh, good grief. Clamps down. And then, all right, wheels down is still there. Now we're looking for bit seven and bit 12 of our output. So bit seven is the naval drive and bit 12 is, did I count that right? 
Uh, was that? Oh, no, that was 11. Where was I? Bit. Step three. Oh, 11, 12. Seven and 12. You see, I think y'all, hopefully everybody's getting the point that, yeah, you don't want to do what I did in this. All right, we have a beginning of angle output. And also, we're enabling our drive now. Why am I enabling the drive, though? The clamps must have come down. See, here's where it, this is really difficult to track. All right, but mainly, in the end, we can see that this would be much easier. Even here, step two, wheels down. And I, I'm just going to throw it in there because I did see step three also has wheels down. So we'll just throw that in there. Thanks, Dewey. I appreciate that. Um, if there's any particular questions you have, uh, feel free to put them in right now. Because yeah, I'm getting ready to shift gears to something else, and I'm not even sure where I'm going yet. I'm gonna, I'm getting ready because I think I think we've seen enough that the sequencer didn't doesn't perform well from a troubleshooting standpoint, and that this is going to be clear. Mainly, okay, if we're and actually that's in cycle, I'd have to figure out the difference between in cycle and auto mode. But mainly, in step two and step three our wheels are going to be down. As opposed to, let's just go to whatever the next one is. Let's just go up. And this one, it says wheels down. But it doesn't tell you what step the particular one is. You know, So either you're going to need an insane amount of documentation for this wheels down, or you know, it's, it's just going to be really difficult. And also, I mean, it's just real... I can't imagine going back and troubleshooting, like troubleshooting this over the phone. I don't know if I could do it. So that's the main thing on that. And I think I think we've shown, yeah, the, the couple of different ways of sequencing. Is if we go back, yeah, we could either, we could do this move. We could do the multiply. I don't like the multiply, although it does the same thing because, I mean, really, just mainly, you add a layer of someone needing to understand that whole multiply and shift in that bit, and I don't think that's necessary. We do have the latch and latch, and I won't knock the latch and latch, but I will say that there needs to be some real caution in making sure there's no pitfalls in the programming of it. But I can't think of a reason that anybody should use what I did here, besides the fact that, yeah, it... It looks really cool, and really, if you're going through, even today, if we're going through, we have a sequencer tab. And there is the sequencer input, the sequencer output, and the sequencer load. And they just look like what you should use to sequence instructions, but I don't think that that's a good use for them. Okay, so... Uh, Jeff Kuiper, let's see. I use bit one for step one. Keep it on when I turn on bit two for step two. That way you can see each one is completed. Yeah, and let me go ahead and jump into it because yeah, I think that's kind of what I did. Am I in the right image? I got to remember um, what image I'm in here. My first, yeah, we go. All right, we're good. Oh, Why wow, that keeps coming up. Yeah, this is this is last week's program, and well, what one I was I didn't do this part right. We've already talked about this that I should have um I should have done some other type of logic a little bit better than the counter logic I did. But mainly, if we go down to some of the action in this machine, I think this is what you're talking about. Is yeah, like here I'm looking for step seven and not step eight. That way, that tells me that yeah. I'm on step seven. And then way down here, hopefully it's at the bottom. Yeah. So then you could look at these and you could look for the green all the way across and figure out what exactly, what exactly step we're on. All right, what did you say there? 
I stay away from the move because you can't easily find step 24 without looking at 30 move instructions. Eh. Eh, I think I think I could do that just as cleanly. I'm not sure. That may be so. So you're saying you would do... I'm not following you, maybe, Jeff. Are you saying you would do the latch and latch also? Or... Or, or what are you saying there? I mean, yeah, because I mean, I kind of did that. Well, no, I really, I did a counter here. Which did make it where I had one counter. Gosh, this, I don't even remember this. This is my 300 rungs before I knew what a subroutine was. So there's a lot of scrolling in this. Let me see if I can find even one. I think I just blew past one of them. Where is one of the... Oh, this actually, this is the original. I did save what we did the um, last live stream just in case somebody had a question, but I didn't open that up. Let's see if I can find. Okay, yeah. I mean, I had kind of this, and then I had a counter, and so it would count up, and this was my step counter in this case. So is that what you mean, or what are you saying there, Jeff? But yeah. This is, um, so this will be, I mean, there's nothing wrong with what I did here. I mean, this, if you recall, this was my uh, three hours of programming experience that I pulled this one off with. Let's see, did I save? I gotta figure out if this is the one I saved. Ah, probably this live stream one. Let's scroll. Let's see. Oh, that's right. We organized this one. <laughs> now, you don't have to endlessly scroll through this one now. But, uh, yeah, so this is what I did in it was I had main step one and not main step two or main step, well, two and not three, three and four. And all those would accumulate a counter each time that any one of these was done. Also, okay, I was asking if Paul's in the chat, and I guess he's not tonight. But he brought up a good point later on. While we're here, let's talk about this, just in case some of you look at this and want to try it. Is like right here, I have main step one and not main step two is going to accumulate that counter. And then let's say that this one was perfectly ready to go. Is this would actually not accumulate a second time because hey, because this is true this time. Next time it increments, this is going to be true and let's say all this was true, it won't increment a second time. And I, we talked back and forth about needing um, some one-shots in here. Like this was the big one I think he was pointing out is that this would need a one-shot because once this one goes true, it goes to this next step, then it wouldn't be able to go again. I could actually fix this a different way. And I thought about it when I was just looking at that um, other program is if I look not to be made C5.5 dot CU. What this is going to say, as long as this is not counting up, then we're going to allow it to count. But then the CU bit's going to enable when the conditions preceding it are true. It's going to come around the next time and this will be false because of this. Then it'll come around again and scan it. So that would that would fix that. All right, Jeff says, I use bits and seal them until the sequence is complete. Then start over at step one. All right, let me see if I can follow what Jeff's saying. Let's go back here. This would, Jeff, Jeff's got some good things. So let's, let's see if I can follow what he's saying. Yeah, this one I'm just going to throw instruction at the top. And let's say... All right, we're in auto mode. And if we're in auto mode, we are going to... Oh, Jeff, I good grief, man. You think I can make it to my email in time? <laughs> um, 
Good grief, I got a ton of emails. Let's see. Oh my goodness, what did you send me? Am I supposed to paste this in? I think you're saying paste this in. All right. All right, this could be scary. Who knows what Jeff's having me paste this in, so I um, apologize for any craziness that may come in. I don't think I can paste this, Jeff. But let's just try and see. Let's see what all you can teach me tonight. Oh, well, you taught me to clock up my computer. Okay, now there we go. All right, so this is what Jeff said he would do. So let's look at it. Oh, Jeff, what do you got going on here? Now, ah, okay. I'm not sure that was something to do with how this pasted in. I get the feeling this is supposed to be here. That's probably supposed to be a one. And then I'm going to create permissive. Oops, missed. And I believe it should be a dent probably. Well, or maybe not because, oh, permissive dot step. Okay, well, we're gonna have some errors in here because I think he had a, um, I think he had it, uh, some user-defined data types. But all right, so here he's looking at all of them. All right, and let's see what he did. I don't think this pasted in well, Jeff. Maybe you can tell me. Get back to my chat. That way you can probably be screaming at me. Uh, yeah, I don't think this pasted in right. What went wrong? Let me see if I can even figure this out. Not 31. That tells me it's done. Oh, man, I have no idea here. Step one. All right, Jeff, you're going to tell me what's going on with the way this pasted in. I don't think it pasted in right. Pretty sure it didn't anyway. Because really we have a shorted branch here. So Jeff probably has something here. We probably just aren't pasting in well. Let's see if I can even think of what's going on here. Um, so permissive step zero. So we're looking for it to be in step zero. And we have step one timer. That's cool. All right, when that timer's done, actually, this will stay done. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. So Jeff's saying whatever condition is. So I'm just going to call this condition one. So this will be why, whatever it's waiting on, then yeah. All right, I can follow what Jeff's doing here. Besides the minor, all oh, the red lines. Why do you use a user to find data type on me? You don't have one of these that didn't list. Can I do anything about this really fast? Let's see, what can I do about this? We're going to replace her Missive dot step. We're going to replace with. Oh, wait, I got to spell it right about. Permissive step. We're going to replace with. Permissive step. Replace all. I'll let that dance around. Good grief, how many uh, wrongs did you? <laughs> I might should have looked at what you were sending me. Well, while we're waiting on this, we have an um haven't mentioned lately that yeah we do put out one video a week and yeah at some time tonight this may be done on finding and replacing so make sure you subscribe to our channel and yeah like this video and yeah if you have a question while we're waiting on this thing to get done searching uh, feel free to put it in the comments and all right I think it's about done I think I can cancel this now can I hit the cancel button or is that gonna undo everything I think I can hit the cancel button let's see if I end up kicking myself or no, there we go, done.
All right, so if we go up here now, I should be able to create permissive step. You now I just want to get rid of the red because it just looks like it makes it a little more difficult. There we go. So now permissive step one, these are all of Jeff's steps of his machine cycles. So he's saying he has step one through 31. Actually, we have a step zero. All right, now I just put that in. So we have condition one. Well, and I guess we have some timers. Let me get some of that out. I have no idea what that's waiting on now. But uh, I know not to hit the um, verify button because we're going to have 200 errors now. But mainly, okay, if we're on step zero, it's going to look for condition one. There's no way that step one can be true yet because this is step one. And mainly, if we're at condition one, and we don't see step 31, then there's a timer and then a done. Thinking about this, I think, you know, Jeff, I think this one has the same pitfall that I had with the latch unlatch though, is let's say, all right, let's, let's just throw some stuff in here, is let's say that that's true. Let's say that that's true and that's true and that's true. All right. And I know that I really need, let me get this out of the way. I really need, step five is what I'm really looking for. I really, if this thing would just run step five, then it would work. My only problem here is someone can easily toggle step five. And then to this case, at this point, what is exactly is gonna be controlling this machine? And we just got the machine really out of sync. That's my that's my only, I guess, issue with that is from a troubleshooting standpoint. And you know, Jeff, I mean, you get in there and you're trying to get something working, you you end up toggling every single bit. Is that that's you know the same deal? I mean, it, it's not function wise, it doesn't affect the machine any, but that's the only thing is you can do that. But no, in the end. Let's just go up. Well, no, you don't, Jeff. I mean, what I'm saying, though, is let's say that I'm online with this machine right now. I'm troubleshooting it, and I just really need step five to work. And, you know, uh, and I just used step five because all this was visible right here. But let's say I was down here on step 11. I'm like, gosh, step 11, they told me that if I had, if step 11 would work, that everything would work. I'm gonna look down here and be like, all right, let me let me just toggle step 11 and see if I can make that work. So that, that's that's the you know, only thing. Now, in the end, we end up with this. Now, but you're right, typically, it would have to go through and you will end up with these nice bits to tell you exactly where it is as the machine's going along and that does make it really nice. Now, I guess I should have put that in here is even if we were doing the um, move way, you also do have this. You don't have it, but it only highlights the step it's on. So if we, let's just add another rung here. And, oh, what was that tag? Sequence, is that what it was? Yeah, sequence dot zero. Then we'll just make that last one an NOP. And yeah, I know there's more of them, but So we go put one. So if we did it this way, it would look a little different because mainly we need a watch window or something. Let me see. How can I do this easily? Yeah, watch. Can you do a watch window while you're offline? Yes, you can. So if I put sequence in here, oops, well, where, oh, there it is. So in this case, I mean, we're gonna start out with a one and that's gonna be sequence zero. And then yeah, we're gonna double it each time. Then 
this time we're going to have with a 2, it's going to shift over. So, I mean, you're going to get a similar graphical feel for it. I mean, again, I, I wouldn't knock either way. I mean, I do, I do see that one hole from a troubleshooting standpoint if, you know, somebody who's toggle happy, which, you know, really in the end, if they're toggle happy, they're probably force happy too, so it doesn't, it may not make that ginormous of a difference, but that's the only difference I really see. I, I would... I would go either way on this. I don't see anything wrong with it, except that. Um, man, let me go down. Oh, gosh. Man, why would you send me so many wrongs? Let me just delete out. Oh, go away. Or did I paste this in, like, multiple times? Let's just get some of this out of here. There we go. Yeah, it kind of shows the same thing. And yeah, there would be a step 31 eventually. Um, you know, the only other... I don't know. I, I can't say anything is wrong with either way. I think they both are good. And mainly both of them, we can also interpret the step number out of them. It may be a little trickier on one or... Honestly, it's not tricky on that. It's just a different type of manipulation. But I can take the permissive step here, and I could interpret a number out of a mainly having step one, two, three, four. That would be a cool math equation sometime. We could do that. So, yeah, that works perfectly fine. So there's another one. Anybody else got any? That, I mean, this is great. We're, we're sharing some really good ways of sequencing some stuff. That's the only ones that really jump out at me. I mean, I think we've, there's some really good ones. Um, let's just go through this program a little bit because, all right, I mean, maybe you can put in the comments here, is there anything in this program that you'd really like seeing us to go over? Because there are, I mean, I must have used every feature imaginable in this processor. And we have a fault handling routine. I don't think we've done any programs on that. What am I doing here? All right, I'm mainly, okay, if there is a major fault, it's going to do the fault handling routine. It's going to get that fault code. And yeah, I do like this alarm system that I had. I probably I probably should revisit it and wouldn't start using it again. Actually, this was pretty innovative. But yeah, we move a fault code. To all the things yeah we show it on the screen so we have fault handlers in here we have power up handlers in here ah, now this one actually this one would be really good this is how you can clear a major fault by cycling the power to a plc now i don't want to argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing but if you have somebody without studio 5000 and their only option is to cycle power on the plc then then here's how you can do it uh, this this would clear it. I'm pretty sure that's what I'm doing here. Get system value. I record it. I'm moving a zero to the major fault type and code, and then I'm setting a system value. Yeah, this would clear it. And no, this would clear it and put it in the program mode. Then they need to use the key switch to put it back and run. But there, that, that might be a neat one. You know, how can you clear a fault without? Without um, a, without a laptop. What else do we have in here? Oh gosh, yeah. I don't want to see another sequencer instruction for a while. Um, and you know we haven't really talked about indexing. Well, and I don't know. If I should have called this index index, but we haven't talked about indexing through arrays to do things. But yeah, that's what this thing's doing. Is it's punching holes in steel and cutting it to length. And that's, you know, and it's actually using the same, in this case, the sequencer. It's repeating the sequencer like maybe 50 times for one part. Uh, what else is in here? Yeah, we, you know, we could, we could, it might be neat to do some basic OEE. I don't know. Could, we could do some OEE calculations. That's kind of, I really, I have almost what you need here to do one. Probably, probably there, everything's in here somewhere for it. OE wasn't exactly a big term then. I have no idea what I'm doing there, though. 
What am I doing here? Oh, okay, so this is how I'm making that multi-list indicator. That would be neat, that's the alarm. A fault handler. I have a drive. Well, and actually, the, you know, we haven't really talked about this one. This one was a motion. This was a servo system. This wasn't, um, you know, a high-speed counter or anything. This actually had, you know, a motion controller on it. Motion control, motion zero. You got to love that. I mean, I know I was trying to make this tidy AOI. I'm sorry, AOI, um, user-defined data type. But this shouldn't be motion zero. I mean, this should be servo off or motion servo off. Stop the servo. It should be something. Let's see. I don't know. I mean, on here again, there's there's not nearly enough documentation on this program. What am I even doing here? All right, I'm getting a position. I can I can deal with that. I'm subtracting raw. Okay, I'm getting a position error. Yeah. And I'm doing some calibration of something. I don't even know. I have no idea. Got a fault reset. Yeah, I mean, these are the basic servo things. And they've changed a little bit over the years, but they haven't changed tremendously. Motion axis move. We got a jog. Got a zero. And I know you got a bunch of math. Let's see, Christopher just asked, are there any Studio 5000 simulators that only require a computer? Yeah, you have, um, is it now called Studio 5000 Emulate? It used to be RS 5000 Emulate. I assume that its name changed with that. Let's see, Studio 5000 Emulator. Yeah, Studio 5000 Logix Emulate is what you're looking for. Now, you know, what I would say there right off the bat, is do you one one Christopher do you have the do you actually have the Studio 5000 software because especially if you're starting out I would not recommend well one I wouldn't recommend buying an emulator period I mean at that point when you're the you need to buy a PLC eventually but you um one I would start at one if you don't have the software is look at connected components workbench which has a built-in simulator and that'll get you through some of the basics, but really quickly, you're gonna want, you want some physical hardware to play with. That, it, I see a lot of people trying to go a little too far with the simulators and the emulators, and there are some differences. And like, I guess what I'm getting at here is do not, absolutely positively, do not try to debug your machine program on Studio 5000 emulate because there are some differences, and there's nothing worse than thinking you have it and then going out in a machine. I mean, especially if you're planning for something because a machine's going to be down, you go in there and you do it and it doesn't work. I mean, yeah, you need some real hardware. If you borrow the hardware, beg, steal, whatever, you need some hardware. But, yeah, I, honestly, starting out, in fact, let me just get a link here. I would look at, um, I would look at the Connected Components Workbench for that. Is one it's free, you know, and that'll probably get you started. Actually, let me just paste this whole series in there. Yeah, check out this series right here. Okay, where we're all right, we're kind of looking in here. Is all right, dry parameters. Oh, okay. Oh, actually, wait. What is going on here? Oh my goodness. Now this is, now actually I should use this in our PID series. So this thing ran an insanely variable steel weight mainly. Is the steel weight on this would be, would vary from 150 pounds to 2,500 pounds. And you try tuning a survey for that, it, it can get difficult. And so what I had here is, well, these are different steel sizes. And based off the steel size, we, I was actually changing the, the gain or pretty much the tuning of the servo because, hey, you get it tuned for some lightweight piece of steel and, you know, then you try to throw 2,500 pounds at it and the thing wouldn't half move. Let 
All right, Todd, I am looking at the trainer on the bench in the center. I'm going to contact you tomorrow. Hold on, I got to get my, I got to get my thing up. Which one are you talking about? This one? Yeah, this one actually is a custom trainer. Um, if I was looking for that, I would actually look at this one. This one, oh gosh, I got too many wires connected to it. Well, here, we, we got the internet. So let's just look here. Um, if I was doing that, let me get back to my screen focus. And let's just go to products. Oh, I guess you need to see what I'm doing, don't you? Yeah, this is the Control Logic Trainer back here. And honestly, that doesn't make for a great trainer, mainly because, I mean, I think wiring is important. And that's not the easiest thing to wire, really, if you're taking wires loose and connecting wires constantly. And that's why I kind of like this trainer right here. Either this one, where's the basic? Should I have this more prepared if I know somebody's going to ask that I would have. But this right here is actually this trainer. You can't see what I'm pointing at, but yeah, the right trainer. That is um that one. Let's see. That um this one right here is uh I kind of like that one, but okay. Todd is looking for, you're looking for an L71. Well, that's a super nice trainer, and yeah, we've built some of them. You know, and the biggest thing with those, yeah, is the wiring. So yeah, call me tomorrow and we'll talk about it. Um oh you can even see on this one. Let me well, while we're here, I'll show you. I'll show you the pitfalls and the cool things about this trainer. Plug that. And if I can get it. Slide it up here. Is yeah. I mean, this is a cool trainer. Actually, this is an L. I don't even know what's in here right now. This is an L63 in here right now. The issue is, I mean, this makes such for, I mean, just absolutely beautiful wiring job but if you're actually like doing wiring exercise and trying to understand syncing and sourcing you're this week you got it wired here next week you have it wired there this is just a total pain to wire into and that's the only issue so even on this one you'll see that i have this one permanently wired so i mean we spin around in the back of this one then yeah we don't do any wiring exercises with it we just do some control logic exercises so yeah that's why normally i like that one that's the one I, in fact, yeah, I'll, I'll usually grab the Compact Logic. It's got the spring terminals and it's really clear. Yeah, I can show a lot more stuff. But yeah, all right, now, now I'm totally off of um, script, but I think we were just going through some um, things here, seeing if there's anything else. Yeah, that's kind of cool here. Oops, you can't see what I think is cool. Yeah, we're looking, um, we're changing, we're cha this, yeah, I should do this in the PID series because this, because really, I could even use, I wonder on that trainer if I could use a weighted ball and completely change the dynamics of it. All right, but okay, that's that. Um, let's see. Eh, this is a little out of what I normally do here. I probably won't do anything with this, but this in this case, I mean, I was reporting runtime data. I was doing all types of cool things. Um, Good grief, I don't even remember half the stuff I was doing here. Um, but there were some cool things. I'm right there, order complete. We're letting we're letting the office know that we've um that we've finished the order. Oh yeah, I said, I mean, um, yeah, I don't even know half of what I was doing, but it looks pretty cool. Uh, we've already been through the inputs. We have a panel view. Uh, and yeah, okay, and it took a little bit of more work on this side, but yeah, this is making a really nice um, fault listing in priority of order. So, like, if you had a fuse blown on, let's just saw, say, um, output card number three, then there's no need in saying that whatever's connected to output three isn't working. So, I mean, it would prioritize. I mean, it was really cool. It, it, it really cut down tremendously on the time that people sent staring at machines. Um, oh. Well, okay, I did. I, I knew how to use wrong comments. I don't know why I didn't use more of them. But, uh, oh, well, I know, you know, I still don't know what screen number two was. But, yeah, okay, look, I, I figured out. I knew, I knew how to do it. Um, yeah, I'm reporting IO states. Good grief, doing a lot of things. 
I don't know if any of this is really worth reporting on or making videos on, but all right. I'm, just, I'm sorry, I know I'm scrolling really fast. I'm just looking to see if there's any real neat highlights. Yeah, I mean, this was really... A, I mean, I know I knocked myself on the sequencer, but this is really a good setup because even here, okay, we're... We're sending a request to the PC. This is data coming from a PC that was we were pushing into an array, and I don't even remember how we were pushing it into an array, but we were. And yeah, I mean, we're we're this is how this machine ran. This machine ran, you know, off the PC, and yeah, that it was. I mean, I know it's common now, but it wasn't that common then. You know, we're, we're reporting all types of footage data. Gosh. It looks like a lot of feet. I guess I guess that machine did run a lot of feet, but all right. Got some I don't know what this is. Okay, you know, I might have gone a little overboard here, but actually all the text on the screen was configurable. So, oh yeah, and I remember why. This was a bilingual machine. This machine would would actually run you could switch it from English to Spanish. Now, I mean, there's a lot of cool things in this. So yeah, all the text, on, and at that time, I don't, I don't know why I did it this way. And I, I know in the Panel View Plus, I think you can switch languages. I'm not really sure. <laughs> it's been a while since I used the Panel View Plus or the standard Panel View. But yeah, all right. All right, status, I mean, that's my alarm. Hmm. Okay, but I don't even know what I'm doing here. Oh, that's right. They have this status add because this is how I was adding. This is how I was making that multi, so making this multi list um, indicator. So there were, it was capable of listing 20 alarms at, alarms at a time and in order of priority, which was pretty cool. So they knew to troubleshoot the first one and then go on to the next one. And I don't know, I got a little serial, oh, serial drive status. I didn't catch that. We haven't talked about much about reading serial stuff. Oh, we didn't use. Actually, can you cross-reference that? Oh, yeah, you can. Okay, so apparently I just left some garbage in there. Okay, but I think that's probably a good starting point. I mean, mainly, really, when I opened this, <laughs> when I first opened this program up, I mean, and I saw that sequencer, I mainly knew that uh, that is definitely what I wanted to concentrate on tonight because a lot of people ask for sequencing and yeah, I'm going to do some sequencing videos coming up, but you're not going to see the sequencer SQO and SQI combination used in any of my videos. So that was kind of my thing. I was like, okay, well, here's my opportunity to kind of go through it if somebody really wants, but hopefully they'll listen long enough to understand that it is not that easy. Jeff asked, hey Tim, does the RS Logics platform inter interrupt, um, interact with IO link components or is that protocol kept separate from controls like you have here? Um, IO link requires an intermediate software. And man, I'm trying to think, there is a company that makes a bridge to go from, I think, Ethernet IP to IO link. Is that real-time automation? Does anybody know? Anybody out there use IO Link? Um, it does not natively support IO Link, at least not as far as I know. Um, no, you know, when you say RS Logic, so that's a broad term because you have RS Logics um, 5, which was the PLC 5. Don't think anything of that, but we also have RS Logics 500, MicroLogix, and the Slick um, 500. And it's definitely not supported on that. Now, Control Logics. I could I could easily be missing something, but I don't think. Okay, Jeff Kuiper says that Rockwell has IO link cards now. Well, let's just Google that then. So Rockwell I O link. Uh, well, let me drag this over here where you can actually see what I'm doing. Smart devices with IO link technology. 
Uh, now Jeff, oh yeah, okay, well, Jeff just saves me the Google. Jeff's, Jeff's sharp on this stuff. Uh, there is the part number. It is, let me throw that, oh, Jeff already threw that in chat. A 1734 4IOL. I have not even played with this module, seen this module, or know what this module is. But okay, it's a four-point IO channel master module. And, <laughs> okay, it exists. It's in the 1734 platform. That's about all I can tell you. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Jeff, Jeff is, real, is much better at the protocols and things like that than I am. He's, he's a whiz at all that stuff. And safety, actually. Every time I have a safety application, I end up having to call him. But, yeah, I like the 1734 modules. Will they go on this? Let me get back over here where I can point. got to remember where I'm at. As, yeah, the 1734s, you can put them right on the end of the Compact Logix L16 and do a lot of communication interfaces and things like that. All right. But, yeah, I think we are at the end of this. Um, but, yeah, be sure in the comments to put, one, one, did you like this? Do you want to see another one? Put it in, a, well, you can put it in the chat really fast. Actually, yeah, put it in the chat really fast because maybe I can ask you some questions if this is already over then yeah put it down in the comments and yeah i'll be sure to read them make sure you're subscribed i mean because yeah we put out at least one automation video a week and yeah we're we're starting to do more of these live streams and that they've really i mean it is it has been eye-opening to open up some of my old programs what would i open up next we've done uh rs logics 500 we've done now on rs logix 5000 maybe we should do something newer uh, we could do how about a connected components workbench i haven't done one of those we could go through i know obviously that's going to be new because it hasn't been out that long but yeah we can go through and see what i could have done better and probably hopefully learn a few things <laughs> hopefully it's not all about bashing what i did in the past but anyway Again, please hit that subscribe button and like this video. Thanks for watching. Till next time. Hey, this is Till. And this is Amber of TW Controls. We run the automation store. Hey, thanks for finding our channel. Here's a playlist with some similar videos. And YouTube thinks you'll like this video. Please like our video and subscribe to our channel. And if our videos have helped you make some money and you're not using our products, please consider supporting us on Patreon. Till next time. See ya.